good morning good evening and uh, good afternoon uh, everyone who has joined this webinar today so we'll be conducting this webinar on, uh, on the topic on how to select the right api management saas for your enterprise um, so before uh, before i uh, begin i have a few announcements to be made one is uh, you can uh, type any questions you have at the end of the webinar so that there will be a question time you can type your questions in the questions tab in the go to webinar uh, dashboard and also uh, we'll be sending the recording and the slides of this webinar to you uh, in a few days and also uh, for the webinar attendees i have a, a little gift to be given uh, so I'll, I'll i'll mention that at the end of the webinar so uh, to start, I'll first introduce myself. Uh, my name is Amila Maharaji. I am uh, currently the Vice President of Engineering for Integration at WSO2. Uh, so I have been in WSO2 for 10 years now. All right. Uh, so and uh, during these 10 years, uh, I have been involved mostly in the cloud projects. And I'll share some more information on that at the end. So. Um, we are here on this webinar today because of uh, API management and API management is needed because of APIs. So I'll, I'll do a, a very quick uh, recap on APIs and uh, proceed. So APIs have been in the technology canvas for nearly or more than two decades now. If you remember or if you have heard like big players like Salesforce, Amazon, eBay, uh, they all released their APIs, their public APIs, after the year 2000. To be more precise, like Salesforce and eBay released it in year 2000. Um, Amazon released it in 2002 and Facebook in 2006. And we know these, these APIs have been widely adopted now, but not only these APIs, uh, all the, uh, like most of the companies, most of the companies who are turning their enterprises into di uh, digital enterprises, they have uh, to do something with APIs. They are either exposing APIs, either consuming APIs, integrating with APIs, likewise. So the APIs have become a fundamental building block of a digital enterprise. And uh, as a result, zillions of APIs have been exposed in the internet, and that has brought the requirement of uh, API management. And it is not just a requirement, it has been a, a very common requirement, a common need, uh, of the enterprises and that's why we need api management so uh, uh, with that with the, with the requirement of api management coming up uh, there there were like uh, uh, there was the introduction of this off the shelf api management products now before that uh, the, the enterprises or the organizations who exposed the apis they had they had the problem of you know of controlling these APIs or managing them. So they had their own homegrown solutions, like, you know, some sort of a code they have written to authenticate or to authorize, do the rate limiting and uh, do all sort of those things. So they had their own code. And then uh, uh, these off the shelf uh, API management products were introduced. So there can be like, uh, there, there are three types of products or solutions which I can identify. So those are the proprietary products, the open source products and the SaaS offerings. Uh, so the proprietary and open source, you know, like nothing to explain uh, specifically. Uh, and the SaaS offering means, you know, like some 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 vendor is uh, hosting an API management solution as a service to be consumed by uh, the the users. Uh, so the API management market is estimated in 2019 to be around 3 billion and it is forecasted to grow uh, to 6.8 billion by the year 2025. And uh, the focus of today's webinar is on SaaS offerings. Uh, because like now, uh, when I say like, yes, there's a need of API management and you know, let's say uh, an organization, uh, an organization decide, okay, we, we want an API management solution and then they have to make a decision on okay whether we are going to get a product and deploy it in our uh, data center or whether we are going to the cloud or whether we are going to consume a SaaS offering. 
so I'm not uh, going to help with that decision. That is a separate topic to be discussed. It, it has separate uh, facts uh, to be considered. Uh, today, the focus is on uh, how to select. Now, if you have made your uh, decision to go with the SaaS offering, then uh, I'm going to help you on making the right choice. Right, so uh, how how I will conduct the rest of the webinar is I have I have selected some of the key points which you need to consider when selecting uh, uh, an API management SaaS offering and I will like, I'll explain what you need to look at uh, with respect to those points. So um, I'll start with those uh, points. The first one is uh, full lifecycle API management. So uh, full lifecycle API management involves you know, uh, creating and publishing APIs. Of course, I, you know, you have to um, make it available for the others to consume. So you have to create and publish it. Uh, then uh, after publishing, it's not, uh, publishing is not enough. Uh, you need to facilitate your API consumers. For example, uh, there should be a, a place for them to uh, discover your APIs and then try it out. Basically, some tool to try uh try the api read the documentation uh give the inputs and invoke it and uh, see the outputs kind of fa facilities and then subscribe to your apis uh, um, generate tokens uh, revoke rework them and do all sort of those things so you need to facilitate the uh, api consumers and then uh, uh to 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 be to provide a fair fair use uh across all the subscribers and also to protect your backlinks you need to do some access control uh, and rate limiting and also for security purposes as well and uh, when your api management uh, strategy evolves you need to manage the life cycle of apis so full life cycle api management and managing the life cycle of apis are two different things um, uh, when we when you say managing the life cycle of apis that means like you create and publish the API, and then uh, after some time, you need to roll out a new version of the API. So you need to now ma maintain two versions of it or two or multiple versions in parallel. And after some time, you can't keep the old versions running forever. So you need to degrade them and retire them. So uh, when you do that, uh, you, you can't uh, impact the existing subscribers. So it should be done in a graceful manner. So that is what meant by uh, managing the life cycle of the API and also when you're doing all those things creating uh, and facilitating the consumers uh, security and uh, this managing life cycles everything you still need to know what's happening uh, with your API so you need API analytics so these are the things uh, which gets involved in full life cycle API management so why it is important to uh, important for a SaaS offering to support all these things because like at the moment you may be interested in just you know publishing your APIs and uh, doing some uh, using it for your internal purposes that means you don't need to facilitate the consumers you can just generate a token and start using it and uh, you may not think about multiple versions or anything but uh, when you when your API management strategy grows you come up you come across all these requirements so if you have made a wrong choice now then if you come across some of these features uh, in six months or one year down the line then you will be uh, hitting a roadblock in your projects so you will have to look for other alternatives then you will have to migrate to another vendor which involves cost and time and you know it impacts your time to go to market go to market time all those things so uh, because of those things you need to be uh careful when selecting the vendor to see whether that vendor supports all these things uh maybe not everything but at least you know you you, uh, you have some vision on what you want to achieve so you, you should know okay in the future i want to go to these these levels of in my api management strategy so the vendor should have um these uh features or support these uh, uh, capabilities so that is why it is important to uh, for us as offering to support these things then we have security so uh, one of the one of the main reasons if you think uh, security is the main reason for someone to do api management it is actually not true but it is one of the major reasons because uh, 
uh, I mentioned in the beginning, so before this off the shelf uh, API management uh, software uh, came into the picture, uh, organizations they used to do their own uh, API management work using their own homegrown code. Uh, so uh, one of the things they did was uh, securing the APIs. Uh, so uh, security is one of the main reasons. And there are different types of security which the vendors provide and which you, you want as well. So I have categorized this into three types. One is security by access control. That means it decides who is allowed to access uh, which APIs kind of a thing. And then security by uh, rate limiting and filtering. So this is about uh, uh, protecting your uh, backend and in ensuring a fair access to all subscribers or all consumers. And then uh, there's additional security, uh, which is security at transport layer, where you tighten the security which you have with uh, the above two options. You, on top of those two, you, you uh, implement some additional security as well by imp uh, implementing some security at the transport layer. So if I talk about security by access control, so this is mainly uh, to secure the API and you control access to the API at the, the entire API level. So most uh, frequently this is done uh, using or tokens or basic authentication or API keys. Those are the, the, the common ways of uh, controlling access to APIs. Uh, from those three also, um, all two tokens are uh, powerful because of their capabilities. They, they allow you to do other options, uh, other things as well, uh, which is how we come to the next one, that is access control at the, the resource level of your APIs. Uh, so what it means is like, this is for advanced use cases, like uh, in, in a simple case, you may expose your entire API to a subscriber, but there may be cases that you want to expose or you want to let them to access only certain resources of your API. It, it, it might depend on how you have designed your APIs. Let's assume that you have uh, read and write operations in, in your API and you might want to uh, let a dashboard um, uh, application to uh, invoke only the read resources and some other application or some other consumer to do the write operations as well. So in such a case, we can secure those resources by going uh, another level by using these um, O2 tokens and the scope capabilities of it. We can control the access at the resource level. Uh, then we have security by rate limiting and filtering. So I mentioned that we, we are doing this to uh, protect your backend services and also to uh, allow a fair usage to all the consumers. So let me explain a bit on that. Uh, let's say that there is a consumer uh, who has got a valid token to invoke your API, but if they start hitting your API with a very high load, uh, then your back, if your backend can't uh, tolerate that, it might get slow and it might impact the other consumers and they won't be able to get a response in a, uh, a considerable or acceptable time. So uh, that it might even crash your backend as well. And uh, it, it, it uh, impacts the chance of the others uh, having a fair usage. So because of that, we need to have some control on uh, how, how the consumers access. So by rate limiting, so um, we can do rate limiting at two levels. Uh, that is, we can we can rate, we do rate limiting per consumer. Basically, if you have like, if you have a, assume you have an API and there are 10 consumers and uh, you can de define uh, how many requests each consumer can do, how many requests each consumer can send at a given time interval, for example, 100 requests per minute or 10 requests per second, that kind of a limit. So that is a uh, that is rate limiting for consumer. And then also there's a there's a limit which your backend API can handle as well. So you need to decide the maximum number of requests which the, the, the SaaS offering or the API gateway specifically uh, should be passing to the backend. So that is uh, to protect your backend and that is done at a per API level. Now, regardless of the, the number of consumers we have let's say you have uh, 10 consumers uh, but if your api can only handle you know 100 requests per minute then you have to limit at that level and uh, uh, you have to do that and you have to then 
decide these consumer limits also depending on that otherwise uh, you will let the consumers to uh, invoke 100 but if your api can handle only 50 then they will also get impacted so that is something you have to uh, plan and uh, do so basically you can create these rate plans and uh, trot throttling tiers kind of things and uh, you can get this done so this is available in most vendors so this is something you should check when you're evaluating a vendor or a SaaS suffering and then you have the filtering so filtering in means like uh, it uh, it validates the request and decide okay which request uh, should be passed to the back end so this is after the authentication like even even the request coming from a valid consumer can be validated then uh, blocked or uh, sent to the back end so uh, one the advantage of this is like uh, this reduces the workload in the back end assume that a consumer is invoking an api with uh, uh, incorrect payload so if the payload is passed to the back end then the back end has to process it and decide okay it can't proceed further then it has to uh, return return the request but if it can be done at the api management layer the amount of work that uh, has to be done by the back end is reduced so that uh, helps to have a uh, to maintain a healthy back end for you so normally uh, these can be done using the headers of the request or the ips which they are uh, initiated uh, or even by looking at the payload uh, so for some of these filtering cases the, the sas offering api management sas offering might need advanced mediation capabilities which i will get back uh, in, in a later slide uh, then we have the security at the transport layer. So this is uh, I mentioned this is adding more security on top of the previous two options. Basically, uh, the options are like we can secure the communication using mutual TLS uh, transport level security. So we can do this between the client and the, the SaaS offering. Uh, normally, uh, there's an entry point to the, uh, the SaaS offering. It can be the API gateway or a reverse proxy or a load balancer running there. So we can have the mutual DLS between the, the client invoking the APIs and the, the gateway. And then uh, we can also implement uh, mutual DLS between the, the SaaS offering and your backend, basically from the gateway, API gateway to the uh, backend. Uh, then uh, you can also have something uh, like VPN or VPC peering setup between the SaaS offering and uh the uh, your data center which gives you the guarantee that uh, only that uh, the, the the infrastructure of that SaaS offering is uh, allowed to access or allowed to talk to your uh, backend services so these are advanced uh, security capabilities uh, every organization might not need this uh, because uh, we can sometimes do this uh, using uh, allow list and deny list uh, kind of things uh, and uh, securing uh, the backend services with basic authentication uh, as well so that there are those options also available so then uh, another key point you need to consider is analytics because you can't do api management uh, in the dark you can you can't expose your apis uh, and let the consumers to come and consume it and and uh, not know what is happening especially uh, if you are exposing it for external users you need to know uh, who are invoking these apis uh, from which regions the requests are coming uh, which use agents they are using and uh, how frequently they invoke your apis those kind of things and also if you are using for internal purposes you may be interested in the latency or uh, which time period in the day we, which are getting a high amount of uh, traffic so you can then plan to scale your backend accordingly so those kind of things because of those things uh, you need analytics you can't uh, stay in the dark uh, api analytics or the business analytics uh, provided by an uh, api management vendor it helps you to identify the frequency of invocations the latency of apis and uh, another interesting thing is it allows you to identify the popular apis and resources especially if you're exposing it to the external parties then when you after identifying these popular apis and resources you can come up with these api products 
So API products is a, is a, is a concept where you uh, combine uh, multiple APIs and resources, multiple API resources into one package and make it available for the consumers. So the, uh, the application users or application developers, they can subscribe to that API product uh, instead of subscribing to multiple APIs uh, one by one. So they can subscribe to the product and uh, invoke, uh, invoke them or consume them in their uh, application. So that, that's uh, what happens in the API product. So that's a bit of an advanced case or a bit of a, uh, not a common case, but maybe good if you are, if you are exposing uh, the APIs to uh, third parties or the outside world. Uh, another angle of analytics, it's not, it's, uh, uh, we can't say it is analytics, but it is somewhat related to analytics, that is uh, alerting. So it is important to know when, when things go wrong. For example, uh, at a given time, uh, the responses to your API request can get slow. It can happen due to a problem with uh, uh, your backend, or it can happen due to a problem in the, the, the API management uh, engine as well. Or uh, your backend may be returning too many errors due to some reason. So you need to know when these things happen. Ideally, when you set up your API management, when you set up the APIs, and when they are in production, you should be able to sleep well, right? Uh, without worrying of uh, them being functional. So if things go wrong, you need to know these things. So you need alerting uh, in these kind of cases. And also there are there are very advanced cases where uh, AI is being used. For example, uh, if there are suspicious API invocation uh, from uh, from some part of the world which has never invoked API, and uh, if there's a suspicious uh, token renewal or token generation, so those kind of cases, there are some advanced AI involved capabilities as well. Uh, those are somewhat expensive as well. So if it, it depends on which uh, which domain your organization is in. For example, if you are in banking, uh, you, it may be interesting for you. And then, uh, so some 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 other thing, some something else which the organizations want to do is, you know, they want to know what is happening underneath. Um, even though the APIs are functioning properly, they need to see okay whether there are errors getting printed. Uh, so they and uh, if they have enabled, if if the organization, if the vendor allows them to enable logs or put some logs, then they want to see those logs as well. So uh, it is. Uh, it may be important for you to view the live logs or the download logs, and then push them to uh, your own uh, uh, observability or analytics system. Uh, not only the logs, but maybe the statistics as well, because then you can create your own dashboard, which maybe uh, which you can consume in in your uh, within the organization. Because most of these large organizations, they have their um, on systems, you know, there are different uh, observability and analytics tools, which I don't want to mention the names here. So because of these reasons, analytics is important. So until now, I was talking about the, some of the features you need to check. But uh, features is not the only thing which matters. When you are at the uh, time of making a decision, uh, the price also matters. It matters a lot actually. So in the in the pricing, so there are normally two models: the pay as you go model and then the tiered pricing model. Pay as you go in the, in the pay as you go model, uh, basically you will be paying for the number of API calls uh, uh, you are getting for your APIs. Uh, at the beginning, it might look very uh, attractive because your your starting cost will be very low, especially if you are a startup or a or a company with a, a small number of API calls. Or if you are, if the, your API traffic is predictable, uh, your your monthly uh, cost will be very less, so it will be uh, attractive to you. But if you, if there's a chance for your API traffic to grow a lot uh, with the time, then your bill will also grow because you are paying as you go. And uh, also, uh, not only that, like uh, with these API requests, some vendors, they charge for the network uh, traffic and all those things, which means it can actually, the, the bill can actually uh, grow uh, further. 
and also uh, if you're enabling more features like so some windows they charge for features so if when you're enabling uh, more features that can also grow your bill so those are some of the drawbacks in the pay as you go model it has its uh, uh, positives and negatives as well in the in the tiered pricing model what happens is there normally there are some tiers some pricing tiers and each tier there is a the limit of api volumes you can go up to for example let's say tier a b and c it it might allow you to invoke 10 million api calls uh, 20 million api calls and 30 million or 10 50 and 100 kind of a thing so then you know uh, if you are in tier a you know that unless your api volume goes beyond 10 million your price will be the same every month that helps you to uh, plan your budget if you know your api volume will stay beyond this limit in the uh, in the in, in the year so that helps you to uh, budget your cost for the entire year this might sometimes look a bit expensive than the the pay, pay as you go model it depends on the pricing tiers the vendors allow uh, uh, so if you have a smaller volumes this may look a bit expensive when, when you compare it with the pricing of a vendor who provides uh, a pay as you go pricing uh, some other things to consider is uh, basically the, the main thing is can you predict your bill with your with the strategy you have can you predict your bill for example if there are feature limitations in these different tiers then you know in the in the uh, in the future when you want to enable more features you might end up in uh, uh, very uh, high tier so very uh, upper tier so uh, that's one thing and the other thing is uh, whether there are hidden costs uh, such as the network traffic or any other things like using the cache or uh, using uh, gateways in a certain region so those kind of uh, whether there are any hidden costs uh, also uh, one other thing is uh, now every or most organizations they might have times where they get uh, spikes in the api traffic for example if you take a, a movie ticketing uh, system uh, if they use, if they have apis uh, if they are consuming apis normally we can expect a high volume of traffic or a spike in the traffic uh, in the in the fridays and the weekends because there's a high tendency for people to go to the movies in those days so in that case like you need to check whether you have to pay extra to handle that spike for example if your normal uh, api request uh, rate is at let's say uh, five uh, APS per API request per second, but if your spike is at uh, 50, then you need to check uh, whether you have to pay more to be able to handle that spike. So that is something you need to consider. And also a very important thing is whether the support cost is included in the price or not. Sometimes like these these sales offerings, they try to make the pricing very appealing. Uh, it looks very cheap, but uh, finally, when you collect all those things and when you're about to go into production, uh, you will see that it was not the price you started with, it is something else. Because uh, the support is very important because you can't uh, run without support. And you need to see once you enable support, where will your cost end? And uh, another thing is the commitment. So, basically, in commitment in the sense whether you need a, a monthly commitment or an annual commitment. If it's a monthly commitment, it is somewhat free. I mean, it is a it's a bit relaxing to you because you can, you know, you don't need to think much. You can subscribe to it and you can start using it. And if you are not happy, you can cancel it. But if you make if you make a commitment for a year, then you 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 need to think. Okay, uh, I have made this amount of money, so I need to stay. Or can get a, can I get a refund and all those things. And also, uh, the your organization might have. Uh, very uh, complex procurement processes so it might be easy for you to go for a monthly payment model because the the amount may be the amount we have to pay be pay will be less and that will let you go in a, in a uh, easy path in the procurement rather than going in a uh, the, the normal approval process so these are some of the things you need to consider when it comes to pricing so with the pricing uh, an, uh, SLA and support goes hand in hand with pricing. Uh, so I mentioned a bit about support. 
uh, but uh, SLA is very important. Basically, the main thing is what is the guaranteed availability you can get out of this service. Uh, because you are you are you are relying on this as offering this vendor. Uh, you your APIs are exposed there, so uh, it has to function uh, at at a certain availability. So normally the, the most common availability provided by all the vendors is three nines of availability. That means 99% nine of the time it will be it will function, it will be available. Uh, another thing which is connected to SLA is the uh, an incident notification mechanism or incident management process. Now I mentioned that once you expose your APIs using an API management vendor, you it should allow you to sleep tight. So if there's a problem, your consumers will start complaining, and you should know whether there's something. We should, the, we should know whether the problem is at your end or it, the problem is with the vendor, the, the API management vendor. So if the vendor has a mechanism to notify you in the in the event of an incident, uh, it is good for you because you know when you are when your consumers are complaining you, you know you have already received an incident notification from the vendor. So you know it is your this, and you can. Uh, control the expectation you can manage the expectation of the consumers and also uh, if they have uh, uh, visibility if they provide visibility on the uptime that is also good because i personally like that uh, from a vendor because that shows us the vendor is a transparent vendor they have nothing to hide even if there are there can be failures uh, every once in a while but uh, they don't need to hide it because uh, they they put it in uh, in a publicly visible manner. So, uh, if you come to support, uh, there are two levels where you need support. One is at the development level, and the other one is at the production level, or uh, the the, uh, the development support and the incident support. Uh, so, you need to check what are the SLAs for each of them. For example, now let's say you are working on publishing your APIs. Uh, and you uh, come across a problem and you raise a ticket and if you have to wait a day or more than that to get an answer to that it impacts your api management project it impacts the velocity of the project so that is something you need to check and then the uh, the incident support if, if you raise a, a problem uh, related to an incident uh, you may have certain expectations you may want to get a response within 15 minutes or 30 minutes or one hour or within, even within five minutes it depends on how critical uh, the, the the information you have exposed in the APIs are. So you need to check that uh, as well. Uh, because all these, like some vendors, they have uh, aggressive SLAs for this uh, support, but it comes at high cost. But uh, you need to think of the overall budget as well. So you need to com compare this as well. And then uh, uh, something else you can check is uh, what are the available support channels, whether it is email, whether it's available through chat, uh, or whether it is through a ticketing system. It, it may not be a big thing. Uh, most of the SaaS vendors provide support through email and chat nowadays. So it, uh, it's the common case most of the time. <laughs> uh, some organizations, they want to uh, look the API management uh, solution they adopt. They want to look it like it's coming from them, especially if they're exposing it to external parties. Let's say uh, a retail organization, they're exposing the APS to uh, outside world for them to develop different applications and they want it to <coughs> look like it's coming from them. So they want to uh, change the theme of the UI, they want to remove some parts of the UI uh, especially the, the uh, dev portal, uh, and they want to uh, they want the API URS to have their own domain and the, the dev portal also, and the dashboards and any other things. And uh, not even that, like uh, some organizations, they even want the emails going out of these vendors. Uh, they have to look uh, like they're coming, uh, they're going out uh, from the, the organization itself. And even some go to the extent of uh, some want to go to the ex extent of even removing anything in the uh, in a error message uh, or anything in a, in a response either. So these are some of the uh, uh, rebranding uh, 
requirements which uh, the organizations will have it depends on uh, uh, what you're trying to achieve for, for internal purposes most of these things might not uh, be of a high importance but for external purposes these are somewhat important so in the uh, when i was talking about access control by uh, filtering uh, so i mentioned that it might need advanced mediate and transform capabilities uh, not all the api management requirements are just to proxy your backend service like the simple sim, sim most simple case is to uh, do a proxy from the api gateway to your backend but most of the cases most scenarios have some requirement to do some sort of a change before it the before the api uh, request reaches the back end or before the response go to the client uh, one might think okay we can do that at the client level or the back end level but it can be costly because if these clients uh, were developed clients and the back ends were developed uh, some time ago and if, if they are in uh, you know maintenance mode or if the cost of doing a change is high, for example, you have to do a release and push it to the, the clients and the backend. So, so there's a cost involved. Because of that, the expectation at the API management layer to do this sort of uh, uh, changes are high. So, so these uh, these changes in you know, like add and remove headers, uh, add a special key which go to the uh, backend. Uh, edit the request and response for example remove some parts from the request and add some things to the response or remove some things from the response and route uh, traffic to different backend endpoints different endpoints based on some logic so the, the request coming from the same user it can go to one backend uh, this time and it can go to another backend the next time the different versions or different backends based on some header or something and also if there's an error maybe uh, different ways of handling errors for example if they get a uh, error response we can uh, enrich that with some information and give some more information to the user and send it to the client that kind of changes so this need uh, the capability of doing transformations and um, mediation uh, not all the vendors have this uh, these capabilities uh, in, in a comprehensive way some have some of these like you know add and remove headers and those kind of things not all of them have these uh, ed editing the, the request response payloads and routing based on uh, some logic kind of things they are not with uh, everybody uh, so i thought of uh, talking a bit about hybrid and multi-cloud uh, requirements now uh, I, I mentioned that you are here because uh, not you are here but i'll be uh, helping you to make a this uh, to select the right api management saas offering assuming you have made your mind made up your mind to go with a saas offering but uh, even an organization if they are looking for a saas offering they may still have some uh, reservations on okay uh, they may be reluctant to uh, let their api traffic go into the internet or go into some other region and come back because of that, uh, they may want to have some some components in their control. For example, mostly it is the gateway. Uh, some advantages of having the gateway close to you is like it reduces the latency because the gateway is closer to the uh, the backend. It reduces the late latency, and it helps you to uh, adhere to security and compliance requirement of your organization and your the, the 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 country you are in or the region you are in. For example, we know that uh, Europe has this GDPR law where uh, it doesn't allow this uh, data to go outside the region. So in that case, you can't use a uh, API gateway in another region because your traffic is going out and coming back. Uh, it also, uh, having the gateway in your control, in your data center allows you to uh, keep the backend uh, not exposed to the internet. Now we know that when you are connecting uh, the backend to the, the SaaS offering, it should be accessible from the internet because the SaaS offering is in the internet. But if a gateway is in your data center, you don't need to expose it to the internet. So that is another, another advantage. 
and also you can have more control uh, of the critical limb components of the solution while still maintaining a low total cost of ownership because one reason for you to go for a SaaS is to reduce your TCO uh, with hybrid it goes up a little bit but still it stays within the uh, within your limits uh, and uh, another extended advantage of hybrid is the multi-cloud capability so example if you are a very you know large organization which has back-end services running in different uh, infrastructure providers such as aws google, uh, google or microsoft uh, in different regions uh, if, if you can if, if the vendor if the, the api management vendor has the ability to run the gateway anywhere you want then you can run it in all those infrastructure uh, providers uh, near to your backend so that will uh, help you to use multiple gateways in different regions uh, for different clients uh, while consuming a single api management SaaS offer i have seen some organizations because of these reasons they have to use they have to go with multiple vendors for your, their api management requirement which uh, which is a hassle right so uh, so I, I, I talked about uh, some of the key points and what do you need to look at in those uh, in, in those points in, in those areas so I'm going to wrap up so I, I talked about uh, so far I talked about uh, these points which you need to pay attention to that is uh, the full lifecycle API management capabilities basically whether the vendor or the SaaS offering has full API management full lifecycle API management capabilities, what security options does it provide, uh, what analytics capabilities does it provide, what is the pricing, whether you can predict your bill, those kind of things, what are the rebrand, rebranding capabilities, uh, what sort of SLA and support you get and the cost of it, uh, what sort of mediate and transform capabilities it has, and also uh, whether it has any of these hybrid or multi-cloud capabilities that may not be applicable to everyone but it is somewhat uh, uh, important and those are some of the main things but apart from that i have another list so uh, so you have to check like some so, some organizations they are very uh, strict in performance or the response time for the api for example if you are uh if you are consuming uh if you if you are exposing apis in of your retail uh, business then uh, let's say it's e-commerce uh, platform uh then you need to have a good response time because otherwise your platform will look very slow if they are uh, if the apis are slow to respond so you need if you have such performance requirements you need to check with the the the, the offering the API management vendor uh, satisfy your performance requirements and due to compliance and uh, uh, regulatory reasons you need to check whether the offering is available in your geographical region at least if if not the entire uh, offering at least it should allow you to keep your api data or your api traffic in your region so that's where a hybrid approach is important um, Another thing is uh, the user and identity management options. Now, for the uh, for the simpler cases, you might not need this, but some you know uh, some organizations they want to plug their identity provider to the SaaS offering, such that the employees or the people who are working on these projects can sign into the API management uh, SaaS uh, by authenticating uh, with their IDP. Basically, it's a federation scenario. Um, and also, uh, they uh, they want to authenticate the end users before generating tokens for them. Um, if you if you are aware of this uh, password grant type in O2 uh, concepts, so in there in there you are getting a token for each and every user invoking your API. So we have uh, user tokens and we have application tokens. So for user tokens, you need to authenticate every user. To authenticate them, the SaaS the API management SaaS should be able to connect to a user store where these users are stored so if if that is applicable to you you need to check that and if you are if you want to monetize your apis 
whether the, uh, the the vendor supports that and the ci cd capabilities to roll out uh roll out uh, the, the apis to production and uh, some other minor things are documentation the frequency of updates updates in the sense you know new features new versions and bug fixes and uh, the flexibility of the vendor especially if you are a small player these big vendors may not uh, listen to you for example if you want some feature uh, you won't get it in a couple of months or a couple of weeks you will have to wait until they prioritize until it comes to the top of their list so those kind of things and also uh, you need to think about certification and compliance as well if that is applicable to your organization so this uh, the white paper was based on uh, sorry this webinar was based on the white paper i have written uh, with the title uh, a bias guide to api management says so the the, the content uh, i brought was from that and there's a fact sheet in that white paper where you can use to uh, use in your uh, evaluation if you are evaluating multiple uh, api management SaaS offerings you can use that um, so let me show that white paper uh, this is the white paper and uh, at the bottom of it you have this uh, fact sheet uh, you can download so i have uh, you can download it here and i have actually filled it for uh, wso2 because it will be easier for you i mentioned that uh, i have been working in the cloud projects for wso2 in my uh, tenure at uh, WSO2 and from that uh, most of my time was spent on WSO2 API cloud uh, it is the SaaS offering of uh, the award-winning product from WSO2 which is the API WSO2 API manager so the API cloud WSO2 API cloud it has the latest version of the product available you can sign up and start using it so the product is at your fingertips uh, it has gateways in uh, uh, many regions uh, in U US Latin EU and APAC um so uh it, it's, it's it's a global solution uh, any any organization in the world can uh, you start using it uh so uh i i i, I request you to go and uh, sign up and uh, have a look at it and uh, i have the, that gift i mentioned uh it is for the webinar attendees so uh, uh i'm happy to give away credits worth of uh 1100 worth of credit to be used with wso api cloud so all you have to do is uh, drop an email to cloud at wso2.com before 7th of august and mention that you attended the webinar and uh, uh, you uh, and a request for the credit so and our team uh, including myself uh, will uh, work on that right so that's it that's all i wanted to cover that's all i wanted to highlight for you to uh, think when you are uh, selecting a api management says so if you have any questions you can type it in the uh, the questions tab i can uh, take them okay um, there's a one question um on uh, asking what is the, the version we have in uh, WSO API cloud so uh, at the moment we have the API manager product version 2.6 and by next week if you if you log into it on next one day you will see the latest version that is the, the 3.1 so the team is working on <coughs> uh, upgrading it there's another question uh, asking uh, about the pricing of API cloud so actually I have put the link uh there yeah, but uh link in the slides but i'll quickly uh explain uh so our pricing is very simple we have just two tiers the micro and the standard tier and the most important thing is there are no feature restrictions all the features are available for uh, in all the tiers and we provide same sla and uh, support for everybody so it is uh, it's quite a uh unique pricing model where you you won't find it in other vendors uh, and the, the the micro tier is priced at uh, 500 dollars per month 
so you won't see such uh, freedom in other vendors there's another question uh, okay talking about security what strategy or what kind of DDoS protection system do you have so there are uh, there are two ways uh, one is at the load balancer level uh, where we have uh, what you, what you call it um, uh, burst controlling and also uh, we are leveraging some other tools uh, so um, which which we have in this uh, the infrastructure service which we have hosted our cloud offering and also uh, we have i mean uh, some this to add something else now uh, this cloud our api cloud offering uh, is used by organizations throughout the world and uh, in uh, many many verticals or many domains like financial uh, transportation energy education um, retail entertainment technology automotive uh, all sort of like uh, industries okay uh, if there are no other questions um i think we can wrap it up so uh, we'll send you the recording and the slides um if you have any questions later after going through the white paper or going through this recording you can reach out to uh, me or cloud.wsl.com so my email is also in the uh, <coughs> Uh, slide deck uh, it's amila m at uh, wso2.com all right thanks for joining the webinar i hope you got something out of it if you are interested in a SaaS offering or if you will be interested in a SaaS offering in the future i hope it will help uh, and uh, do reach out to me if you need to discuss anything thank you